Καλησπέρα σας και καλωσορίσατε κυρίες και κύριοι σε αυτό το πολιτισμητικό ε, φιλοσοφικό διάλογο. Μέρ Καμίνης, Πρέσδεν Τσισάνο, Προφέσσα Παντερμαλής, Εξελενσίες, Λέιδες και Γεντλμεν. Welcome to the Socrates Confucius Dialogue, uh, kickstarting the sixth annual Athens Democracy Forum. Well, globalization is uh, meant to drop uh, borders between us all and weave the world together. So one way of doing this um, is by bringing two great civilizations of this world, Greece and China, together and actually bringing Socrates and Confucius sitting side by side. Um, you know, because I think that getting the two of them to speak about the perils of um, globalization, we might actually find that middle path that we're all seeking and solutions to, to our challenged world and democracy. So I hope that this session sets the tone for the next two days of discussions of Athens Democracy Forum and inspires us all. Now, there's no more appropriate place to do this than here. The penultimate uh, temple of Western civilization uh, that fittingly launched the Forbidden City exhibition just this weekend. So East does indeed meet West in this building as we speak. And, you know, it's an idea that's been percolating in my mind for quite some time, but when I met with uh, Professor Padermalis, uh, and thank you, Professor, very much for making this uh, possible, it just dawned on us that we have to bring Confucius and uh, Socrates together, finally. So, along with the wonderful exhibits from China, we have Professor Joseph Chan from the Department of Politics, and public administration of the University of Hong Kong. And on the other side, well, and in keeping with our times, guess what? Socrates is a woman. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> <laughs> so Professor Angie Hobbs from uh, Understanding Public uh, Philosophy uh, Department at the University of Sheffield. And well, the challenging task, though, really falls uh, to my boss <laughs> of moderation of these two wise people, um, Mark Thompson, the president and CEO of the New York Times uh, company. Um, well, Mark represents media, and media, as far as I'm concerned, is that hyphen in that composite word, democratia. We can't see it, but it's in the middle, bringing the Dimos and the Kratos together. So tonight, let's see what happens by bringing Socrates and Confucius together. So Mark, over to you. <laughs> so, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're in, in for a treat. As you've heard, we have the two greatest philosophers who ever lived. Debate that. Uh, uh, on my right, we have the local boy, Plato. Plato. No. <laughs> Plato never mentioned the red hair, by the way, but we'll let that go too. Um, uh, and on my left, the the challenger from the East, Confucius. Um, and they're both going to help us uh, uh, both diagnose and maybe help us towards um, one or two solutions. Uh, for our democracy, for our system of government, which, as many people here know, is, uh, faces many stresses and strains. Um, so we'll see. They've been, um, uh, they've been out there somewhere. I think Socrates thinks he's in Elysium. Uh, I'm not quite sure where Confucius thinks, <laughs> thinks he is. He had a, hey, a different eschatology. But, but, the, the underworld. <laughs> the underworld, OK. <laughs> um, but they've, they've been, uh, uh, through the magic of the internet, they've been able to uh, keep abreast of, uh, of the debates. They follow uh, news events very closely. So they're going to they're be, I think, rather more attuned to what's going on than, than you might, might think. Um, we should just, to give people a chance, though, um, I'm going to ask each of you um, just to give us an, just a flavor of... Let, I'll begin uh, uh, with you, Socrates. Just give us a minute on... Uh, uh, 
the, the way you think about politics, politics uh, in, in your life, your earthly life, but also political thought, what, what do you stand for when it comes to politics? Thank you. Uh, well, I had very mixed feelings about the Athenian democracy, even more so after it put me to death. Um, <laughs> however, however I, I did understand that living in a democracy where free speech was allowed, that was what enabled me to carry on my career as a public philosopher, tramping around Athens, cornering individuals, both ordinary and illustrious, and questioning them, finding out if generals and politicians and artists really knew what they claimed to know, finding out very often that they didn't. Uh, however, though I really wanted to challenge expertise, I didn't want to get rid of expertise. I, I, it was because I so believed that we do need experts in government that I wanted to challenge those pretending to expertise. The kind of expertise I was interested in was expertise in virtue, which I think uh, is knowledge, knowledge of the good life, both the good individual life for a human, but also a good communal life. And I didn't think that any other questions could be sorted out until you knew what the good human life was. And I wanted to develop a technique uh, for living the good life. I didn't get uh, directly involved in Athenian political affairs. I played out my part when I was asked to. I served in wars, in campaigns. Um, but when I was asked to go to the uh, Salamis to arrest the, gen uh, the general, I think the uh, Leon, um, and bring him back to Athens to be executed, I refused to do that in 403 BC because I didn't think the evidence stacked up against him, and I got into some trouble with that. So, however, though I didn't take part in formal politics, I absolutely took part in the political civic life of Athens, uh, really helping everybody to examine their lives. I thought that the unexamined life was not worth living, and to understand that the most important thing any of us have is our own individual soul, and that we are the only people who can damage our souls through doing wrong to others, other people can only damage our bodies or our material goods. Nobody else in the world can damage my soul but me. Uh, and that's why I ended up saying that uh, nobody does wrong willingly because nobody would do wrong if they realized they were damaging their eternal soul in the process. Um, I mixed with both Democrats and oligarchs. Um, I taught uh, a few people who went on to play a bad part in uh, oligarchic tyrannies in Athens. And as a result, I was associated with the oligarchic faction, I think rather unfairly. Um, and that was one of the reasons I was put under a show trial. I did not corrupt the young. I did not introduce new gods into Athens or refuse to worship the city's gods. It was pretty much a political setup. I tried to keep a balance um, in, in political affairs. But I wanted every individual to examine their life, examine their soul, and work out how nothing, no wealth, no power, not even health, nothing means anything unless we exercise it virtuously and live the good life. Okay, so Confucius now, you, now you, 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 you've had on earth a much in common um, superficially with Socrates. You, you, uh, uh, you um, uh, also had some very loyal followers and disciples. You, you, none of your own writings, if you wrote anything, come down to us except through the memories and the, and the, and the writings and uh, stories and conversations gathered by your disciples and others. Um, and you also, um, also went in pursuit, a, a kind of interior pursuit and a pursuit in conversation of what constitutes the good life, um, how, how we should live, and, and also, I think, hints about what a good society might, might live with. But tell us a bit more about that and how right. your approach differs from uh, um, our talkative friend over here. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me. And um, I find it very awkward that I have to speak in English as the greatest teacher of China. Um, but let's try. Um, 
you know, uh, future historians would say that I was born around 550 some BC, but they wasn't. They were not very. They, they are not very sure about exactly when I was born. And so I and I died when I was, you know, at the age of 70. They say that 71 or 72. And um, I ha I have a big political ambition, but uh, I didn't have. I don't have much fortune. And I, I'm given a low-level ministerial job in, in the state of Lu. Yeah, you didn't actually get yourself executed. In <laughs> no, <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I couldn't persuade my boss to uh, raise me up in the political ladder, as it were. Uh, my boss didn't appreciate my talents. And so I had to, I had to go away. And I traveled to other neighboring s states. At that time, China wasn't a unified China. There, there, there were a few states. And uh, I, I tried to persuade other rulers to implement my political vision yeah. and my conception of the good life. And what, what, what is my political vision? Uh, I live in the, a, a time of crisis. The social and political order in my time is in, in the process of collapse. So the political elites have become much more sort of self-centered, corrupt, and uh, they are interested only about their personal benefits and wealth and political power, and they forgot the people. They, they are not working for the common people. And so I am determined to give this, to revive this social and political order by reviving the spirit of that behind, that lies behind the order. So the spirit is that the rulers are not given political power because they are well-born or because they are wealthy, because they belong to a certain aristocratic class, but that they should cultivate, cultivate themselves to become virtuous gentlemen, junzi, and to work tirelessly for the people and to gain the trust and love or support of the people rather than the other way around. So for me, uh, government is, should be by those who are truly worthy, by those who are truly virtuous and competent. But although I try very hard to sell my political vision, nobody listened to me, unfortunately, <laughs> and I failed to gain any political sort of uh, mileage in my uh, almost three decades of traveling in China. So that at the end, I end up being quite successful uh, in teaching disciples who follow me to one from one state to another. So life is such a sort of uh, treat, as it yeah. were, but also a failure to me. And I never predicted I will become the greatest teacher in China and perhaps yeah. in, in, in the east, eastern part of the world. <laughs> so let me ask you a, a particular and, and topical question. Um, you, you, were, you were a minister uh, you, 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 uh, to one ruler, but you advised multiple rulers. And in your conversations, you often deal with the question of, of how councillors should, should, how should they behave with a, uh, a bad ruler? What, what's the right, what's the honourable thing to do if you discover your ruler's bad? So we got a, a, a letter at the New York Times, actually it was an article in the New York Times, an anonymous article recently. <laughs> um, uh, 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 um, so we'll, we'll call the author anonymous. Uh, but we titled it, I'm part of the resistance inside the Trump administration. Here's a quote. It may be cold comfort in this chaotic era, but Americans should know that there are adults in the room. We fully recognize what is happening, and we're trying to do what's right, even when Donald Trump won't. So this is um, uh, uh, someone who thinks of themselves as a wise counselor, who has decided to stay secret, they're, they're anonymous, who um, has decided not to uh, resign, not to, not to leave, even though he's, he's worried, or he or she, I should say, is worried about what the, uh, 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 what the president is doing. Confucius, do you think that's the, the honorable thing? Is that the best course for such a, a counselor to take? That's a very tough question, Mark. <laughs> um, I think I would have two points to, to share with you. The first is a very general statement that, which allows exception. The general statement I would like to make is that when the way that is 
the principles, you know, the true values, prevail in a particular state, then we gentlemen should offer ourselves to serve in the government. But when the way, when the way disappears or retreats, then we should also retreat. We should not serve in a bad government. That's the general statement. But there are exceptions. If you serve in a bad government, serve a bad ruler, but in doing so you can prevent gov the bad ruler or the government from killing or engaging in massacre, if you can restore peace through helping a bad ruler, either by remonstrating him or by you know, doing tricks, then although this apparently violates the loyalty relationship I have as a minister to the ruler, but from a consequentialist ground, from the sake of humanity, for the sake of humanity and the well-being of the people, at certain times we, we should have to make a difficult choice, and that would, would be an understandable thing to do. <laughs> so, Socrates, what, what, what's, your, what's your answer to the same question? Uh, I took a very clear view, and I, I said this in the, my defence speech at my trial in 399. I said that I made a very deliberate decision not to enter politics in Athens because I saw Athenian politics as so corrupt. I thought I could have done no good there. I thought I would have been put to death many decades ago if I had gone into politics. Um, and I decided to try and do my civic work, my political work with a small p, if you like, outside the regime. Uh, so I did try to, I didn't think I would have been able to help. I do understand uh, the question. I did have friends and regimes who made different decisions to me, but I thought I could not help within the regime. I thought I could do my civic work outside the regime. Now, you talked earlier about expertise, and in particular yeah. the kind of expertise which goes with trying to uh, uh, achieve a true understanding of, of, of the world and, and the things that matter. You've watched our societies grow, and expertise, we, we invented a kind of pretend classical Greek phrase, technocrat, to, to mean all the different kinds of expertise that, are, that, that we, we, most of us believe is necessary to run a modern society. But one of the things that's happening now in, in politics across the Western world is a doubting about whether experts can and, and should be trusted. And again, I, I've got a quote from you. This is uh, from the Br uh, British minister, Michael Gove, who is one of the, uh, was one of the, and remains one of the leading lights in the campaign for the UK to leave the EU. And, and what Michael Gove had to say was, I think that the people of this country have had enough of experts from organizations with acronyms saying that they know what's best and getting it consistently wrong. And many people, that, was, that quote is often simplified to, this country's had enough of experts. Um, how important do you think it is that, that those people who govern um, have expertise? Really good question. I've been watching Michael Gove with great interest from Elysium. Um, and I took great note. <laughs> I took great note of that quote, and I was very interested in whether he simply didn't realize that the first part of the quote would be taken out of context, or whether he did realize that and was speaking to a particular uh, demographic. Uh, so, I do want those in charge to be experts. I want them to be experts in virtue, and which, as I've said, is knowledge of the good life, not just for their own particular class, uh, but for the community as a whole. However, in my uh, explorations uh, around Athens and in engaging so many people in conversation, I found that most, many people indeed, most people who claim to be experts are not in fact uh, experts, that they have pretensions to knowledge that they can't live up to. So I'm all in favor of challenging claims to expertise, they should be challenged, so-called experts should, should be questioned, and that is good and healthy in an ongoing democratic conversation. However, to challenge a claim, a specific claim to expertise, and to question it, and to ask the expert to justify themselves is not the same as wanting to get rid of expertise altogether. We absolutely don't want that. I hated the way uh, in Athens in my time, certain key posts in the state were decided by lot. I thought that was a disaster. Um, 
I think we do want people who know what they're doing, but we want them to know what they're doing in this broader context of having a techna of the good life for the community as a whole. But what's interesting, when we hear, when we hear Confucius talking about uh, uh, the way he thinks about politics, the, 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 the sense of um, the connection with the people, the, the sense of uh, um, the values and the example shown uh, by the political leader and the kind of empathy and the orientation of the person to the leader, it adds a kind of uh, a, 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 a moral or a kind of almost emotional dimension to the relationship between uh, the ruler or the rulers and the ruled. And I have to say, without being critical, Socrates, when I, when I read particularly Plato's uh, uh, version of, of you um, in The Republic, there's a sense of a rather chilly world of very remote philosopher kings, a, a kind of elite class uh, with the common people in many ways controlled to, to ma maintain an orderly society. And I, I wonder whether many of the popular politicians today wouldn't say that our leaders have fallen into a similar trap. They've become too distant from, too wrapped up in their own world, and not sufficiently in tune with ordinary people. I think you make a good point. I should point out that my pupil Plato, of whom I'm very proud, but he, he, and he, <laughs> did, he did go on to talk about philosopher queens as well as philosopher kings, and as we're gender fluid yeah. now and very on trend, that's a good thing. Um, he, he, he does take the notion of political expertise even further away from popular opinion than, than I did in, in my lifetime, that is true. And there is a great, when I uh, was put to death in 399, he was developing ideas where there was quite a distance between the two. Um, I personally was not entirely happy with that distance. I always remained within the Athenian polis. I always uh, did my work in the gymnasia, in the marketplaces, and I tried to keep in touch with the people, and I didn't just talk to the elite, I talked to everybody, I discussed my ideas with slaves, um, and indeed with women. Um, so I would say I had a bit more of the popular touch than my rather aristocratic pupil, Plato. But if I had to choose, if I had to choose between emotional empathy um, and knowledge, an actual knowledge of what the good life consists in, um, I'm afraid I would choose knowledge. Now, Confucius, I want to, th this conversation we're having is uh, a wonderful example of, of, of globalization at its best, the, the bringing together of different ideas and, 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 and different cultures. But um, many Western countries, uh, and arguably countries, uh, uh, non-Western countries, uh, in many regions of the world, are struggling with some of the consequences of globalization. This sense of a distance between uh, global elites who, in many cases, have benefited from the economic um, liberation of, of world trade, and who are very comfortable to move from country to country in pursuit of, of, of their version of the good life. But people's ordinary people in, in various ways left behind, left out of prosperity, left out of the opportunities of globalization. How, how do you, um, and, and the way you think about, how do you think about globalization and do you have any advice for us about ways of, in a sense, living with globalization and, and um, integrating globalization into our political uh, lives and our political structures? Well, uh, I don't want to appear to be presumptuous because I, I stayed in my little underworld and I only observed from a great distance, you know, the, the recent uh, phenomenon of globalization. Uh, I, I would say um, uh, globalization has present, presented a, a huge challenge to uh, liberal democrats. And on the one hand, there is intense competition between states in economic matters. Yes, there's trade, but there's a greater competition. Competition of talent, competition for resources, competition of the labor market. On the other hand, globalization has seriously undermined the capacity of the states to intervene, to protect the well-being of the people, 
and to curb the influences of the gigantic you know, CEOs, uh, multinational CEOs. So uh, Democrats, as I see them, they, they want to, uh, they are a bit at a loss. They, they want to curb. But they, they also think that you know, perhaps we need a strong state to, uh, to, to be able to maintain welfare, to protect its economy. But on the other hand, they are very sus suspicious of strong leaders and concentration of power. And so they face a dilemma. You know, some radical Democrats think that oh, we should cure the problems of democracy by bringing more democracy. But other people believe that, well, perhaps we should bring in more experts. I think, as, you know, uh, as someone who, who lived in China for so long, is that um, I would not go down the road of radical democracy. Because, uh, not because com the common people are, are stupid or anything, but because they, they don't invest, invest enough time to, to educate themselves about public affairs and these complexities. I would rather like to go for a strong leadership solution, but not the present elites that we see, but elites that are truly virtuous and caring for the people. And so they should not be, uh, feel they, be they should not be in a relationship of alienation from, from, the, from the public, but they should actually try to do very hard to command the respect and trust, trust of the people. And, uh, now, how to bring about elites of this kind within a capitalist democratic setting, within the setting of competitive election, uh, when in the age where you know, people think they know best, each of us has, has our own great opinion, uh, how can we achieve a better balance between experienced, competent, and virtuous leaders and popular control of them from the democratic side? It's, a, it's a, the most important question for today's world. And I don't have an easy answer, but I think everybody should think about it. And when you look across the landscape of, of, of present-day countries and present-day leaders, do you see anyone that you think goes some way to meeting that ideal? Are there any, any leaders out there that we could point to who... who uh, you were pretty critical of the leaders of your own time, by the way. Yes, are, are we doing better than 6th uh, mm. uh, century BCE China? Well, I don't know enough of the, all the world leaders. Um, I only read newspapers and of a limited you know, circulation. And <laughs> so uh, what could I say? Mm. Uh, I mean, just pick an easy target. You know, Obama seems to strike me as, a, as an honorable man, but he, he, he has failed to uh, protect his citizens yeah. from the bad consequences of globalization. Yeah. He's not you know, uh, smart or competent enough in that economic management. But the president, president of the United States is yeah. the other extreme. Uh, there, was so a there was a moment when, uh, just a few weeks ago, when the um, uh, American Senator John McCain died. And they showed yeah. various clips of McCain right. through his career. And there's one clip of McCain who's doing a town hall, a public meeting. And a woman um, is asking him a question. And she starts saying that Obama yeah. uh, is a Muslim, he's not a Christian, he's not an American. And it might have been politically convenient for him to kind of nod. And he said, no, that's not true. You see him denying it uh, uh, in, in favor of the truth. And I thought that was a, that's a, yes. that's a moment yes. of honesty yes. <laughs> and, yes. uh, and of honor, uh, rare, rare moment. Um, one of the things that, that the people who are anxious about our democracies today worry particularly about the degradation of political speech, about the lack of civility, I think something which would have greatly concerned Confucius, but also about uh, uh, the collapse of, of rational argument and the, the rise of exaggeration uh, um, and kind of wild and reckless talk and indeed famously fake news. Just tell us how, how um, in the Republic you have a very troubling and, and um, uh, a pessimistic passage about the risk of democracy giving way to demagoguery as a kind of distortion of democracy uh, and that then leading to tyranny. Just talk a little bit about when you, when you see and hear the way 
political discourse is happening uh, in many Western countries, how, how, how that feels and, and what, if anything, what advice have you got for us about how to counteract it? Yes, absolutely. And there were plenty of uh, demagogues in my own time in, in ancient Athens, uh, such as Cleon. And just after my time, my pupil Plato experienced a, lo a lot of demagoguery, particularly in, in Sicily. Sicily. So though I'm not particularly enthusiastic about democracy, or at least I have a lot of doubts about it, I do think tyranny is very much worse. And what I see happening in my, what I saw happening in ancient Athens and what I, it troubles me to see happening again is that uh, a demagogue takes power by democratic means. Uh, referenda are particularly good at this. I understand that Hitler, I did pay attention to Hitler. Uh, he came into power through democratic uh, referenda in Germany, which I, and I understand they've been illegal in Germany ever since, just the thought. Uh, and once he's got power, he then appeals to his popular base by whipping up emotions, particularly negative emotions of fear and anger and resentment, and bypassing appeals to facts and reason and argument. And that seems to me an enormously dangerous step to take, and we're, we're seeing it happening again now. When that happens, um, then he starts to say that only he can channel the will of the people. And there's this very dangerous phrase, will of the people, as if there is only one homogenous mass of the people with one homogenous mill, and there are not individual and varied opinions. And it's, a, it's extremely dangerous. And, and it suggests that anybody who votes against this particular demagogue is not one of the people and not a proper person. And the demagogues, and it's usually a he, it doesn't have to be a he, it's usually a he, says, I am the champion of the people, and anybody who's against me is an enemy of the people. And that includes the institutions that support democracy, such as freedom of expression, a free press. We didn't particularly have a press. I've been, very, I've been watching the development of a free press since the 17th century. Um, uh, the rule of law, the, an independent judiciary, all these supports for democracy start to be attacked by the demagogue who says that the, they are getting in the way of him implementing the will of the people which he understands better than the people do themselves. Um, he tends to start up external conflicts to keep the people fearful and distracted because he's appealed to people's fears and their resentments. He needs to keep them feeling resentful, so he needs to keep them, actually keep his uh, electoral base poor and fearful. And if they start to complain and say, this is not why we voted you in, he can get really, really dangerous. I have, in the past, in ancient Athens, I I have seen murder committed, um, and then the demagogue turns into a full-blooded tyrant. And it starts with phrases like, will of the people, champion of the people. Beware when you hear those phrases. Analyze them. Do not leave your brains to one side. Keep thinking. Keep defending facts and truth like Senator McCain did. Uh, keep believing in the power of truth and argument. And of course, emotions are important, but do not let negative emotions usurp the political debate. So I'm going to come to the audience for a moment. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to, to <laughs> ask Confucius and Socrates anything, anything you want. <laughs> Just while you're coming up with, uh, with questions, though, one, one last thing uh, to Socrates. There's a, there were another group of people um, uh, wandering around Athens in, in, in the Athens of your time. And I'm thinking of people like Gorgias, ah. the, 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 the teachers of, of rhetoric. And these are, these are people who are, who are uh, for, for money, uh, um, uh, teaching young, young men how to persuade other people. What are the tricks of the trade of, uh, what are the kind of levers of persuasion? 
Um, and actually, uh, one of the things that uh, 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 Socrates accuses Gorgias of is, 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 is kind of a, a kind of the knack of rhetoric. And he uses this word empiria. Mm. We get the word empirical from it. Yes. The idea is, you know, if you're a cook, you find out exactly what people like to eat and you yes. just give them what they want. Mm. Well, we've got machines which yes. do that now, mm. and a lot of our politics is filtered through uh, 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 environments where machines are optimizing the whole time the way the kind of how do you press people's buttons and get them to do what you want. Yes, I, absolutely. You're talking about the sophists, and we're seeing sophistry on the rise again, and it goes hand in hand with demagoguery. We need to be very, very well aware that the stuff we're seeing in our Twitter feeds and so on is being fed to us. Um, and that, again, uh, peop uh, machines are being programmed to give us what they you know, it is assumed we're going to want to hear. There is a very important distinction between a rational choice and acting on a whim and indulging a whim. And there are different words and phrases for that in ancient Greece. And it's really important that we uh, have a media, including a social media, where it is possible for us to exercise rational debate and thought and real rational, informed accurately informed rational choice and doesn't just indulge and pander to our whims and our worst instincts. But that is what I see happening at the moment. Okay, now let's have some questions from the hall. Right, we're third row. We're going to get a microphone too, I think. Just, just here at the front, three rows back. Yeah. And do, do please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kishore Mabuvani. I come from uh, Singapore, uh, from the National University of Singapore. My question is for Socrates. Uh, and I think if, and his pupil Plato, and if his pupil Plato became alive today, obviously he would say, I've been proven right by the populist forces that have emerged, the tyranny of the majority, election of Donald Trump, but that, I think, is only the surface of the problem. I suspect that Plato might actually see something even deeper and something more fundamentally, structurally wrong with democracies today because what the democratic populations are doing are spending money that they don't have and they're counting on future generations to pay for it. And that, of course, leads to grief and disaster eventually. So my question to you is, if Plato were alive today, what are the key structural failures he would point to in contemporary democracies, and what would he say about fixing them? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I don't think this just applies to democracies. I think it applies to many types of political constitution across the world. He, he would say that there are three main kinds of goal that you can go for in life. You can serve truth and reality, which he thought rightly or wrongly, that philosophy did. He thought you could serve uh, st status and ambition, and the best kind of ambition and, uh, would be to, in virtue, and the worst kind of ambition would be to sort of get power over other people and so on. Um, and then he thought you could serve money and material wealth and the display of material wealth. And where he, th and he would certainly say we were, um, we have got our values very deeply wrong across the world, not just in democracies, because we are valuing status and money more than truth and reality. But even worse, we have conflated uh, the, the goal of ambition, of status, with that of material display. So we're not even being ambitious to be virtuous, yeah. which would be one step up. It's not as good as being yeah. a philosopher, but it's one step up. We are being in ambitious to earn stuff and display stuff. And I think he would say that until we really rethink our attitude to stuff and to money and to growth, and until we start looking at growth in terms of emotional intelligence and uh, sort of social sensitivity and, and so on, then uh, democracies certainly are going to be in trouble, uh, capitalism is going to be in trouble, but also the future of the planet is going to be in trouble. So, okay. that, I think, yeah. Excellent, good. 
I'm Roger Cohen, a columnist for the New York Times. Uh, Confucius, I'm in awe of your wisdom. And um, I'm wondering what you think about hubris um, in a political leader, the dangers of hubris, and in particular what you think about the Chinese leader opening the possibility now of ruling for life. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I have this reputation that I often confess that I'm ignorant rather than wise. And when people claim that they are wise, they are full of hubris. And my reputation is built on my consistent uh, commitment to improve my own self, to learn and to think harder than most people around me. So I want my leaders whoever they are, China or other people, to have this humility that they do not know everything, that they must somehow pause and give themselves time to read and think and study the history and, and also you know, to, to have a direct connection with the human heart of the people. And uh, so if somebody like Xi Jinping who, who thinks he knows best for China, he, he, who doesn't give much room for dissent and disagreement, and who really uh, engages in a high-handed you know, uh, suppression of different opinions, then I think, uh, as I said in, in my student edition of my conversation, the Analex, that when a state allows only one opinion, one ideology, it will mostly and easily crumble. So when that one ideology is wrong, that one word is wrong, then the whole state is wrong. So I hope you know, the president leader of China or whoever else in the United States will understand the importance of certain room for dissent and disagreement. And uh, only uh, if you know, uh, this self, uh, what, what, how, how, how should I call it, self aggrandizing people who are only interested in their own reputation. These, are, these people are not fit for politics. <laughs> Bravo. Now, what else have we got? I'll take one of the, one of the back there. If you give me quite a few hands up. My name is uh, Dimitri Logothetis. I'm a filmmaker from Los Angeles. And uh, I pose a question to Socrates because you talked about the soul and how you tried to cultivate the soul. And I think for the first time in history, we've got billionaires and now trillionaires in the world. And I think beyond the government, I think these billionaires and trillionaires have the ability to do things like hire people and pay them beyond minimum wage, <clears throat> provide for things that perhaps their corporations don't necessarily need, and we don't need to impose that on them with a the government, but certainly we can try to impose that on their souls and create a kind of a moral responsibility. And, and these people don't just exist in the United States, they exist here, they exist in China, and I think that they can probably do things a lot quicker than any government um, if they choose to, and some of them have. Um, so I, I pose to you, how do we inspire their souls? That's a, thank you so much for that. And it's, um, it, it, this problem with capitalism and people wanting to be incredibly rich and hang on to the money is surprisingly recent. I, I noticed that in the old banking families in the 18th and 19th century, if you died a rich banker, you were deemed to be a failed banker because you were meant to have invested your, in those days, millions into public hospitals and um, schools and so on. So it is, it is really rather recent and it goes back to this comment about how we seem to have conflated status and being an admirable human being with the consumerist consumption. Um, 
So even for those, and most of us, uh, including me, and I don't, because I don't claim to be, I don't even claim to have knowledge, but even uh, those of us who can't aspire to the heights of my pupil Plato's philosophers, we can aspire to achieve, uh, to be uh, competitive and to be ambitious, to be better people. Um, and it's if we, if we can somehow reboot society, so honor is given to honorable people, and celebrity is given to people who do or say things worth celebrating. Uh, so it's this, div what we need is this divorce um, of status from consumerist uh, ideals and display. And that means that even those of us who can't be perfect, we can work on our ambition and our desire to be human beings who count for something and to do it through uh, honor. So one thing one can do, so these billionaires who run, who are CEOs, of, maybe some of you are CEOs here this evening, well, you can look at your pay and merit and reward structures in your organizations. You can look at giving pay for people who, and, and reward people who really do do social good and so on, and, corporate, and really do something positive for corporate social responsibility. So we can't just clean up society overnight, but those of us with any influence in our institutions can look at rewarding different types of behavior. So one, one last question, a gentleman in the back, if you stand up, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm a gentleman behind. Uh, we're all going to be around, you can, you can talk to the great philosophers privately afterwards, but this is the last one, and a quick question and a pretty quick answer, I think, probably. Hi, I'm Royston from Mumbai, from Grameen. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned once in a lifetime with two people who are really alive eternally, but uh, the question is on social sensibility that both of you touched on in this age of migrants and refugees, uh, both Socrates and uh, Confucius, how would you guide us? Well, first of all, I, I don't attach too much ethical significance to territorial boundaries or racial identities because I believe in humanity and human virtues, which are general ideas and values that everybody can, can live up to and aspire. And I also believe that anyone who has a benevolent heart, Ren, should feel a compassion and also an urge to help those who are dying, who are dying in poverty or in war. And so we should do our best to help those who are in need of help. And within our cap capacity, of course. You know, uh, and, but I would say we should start from those who are closer to us. And if, and, but we, our concern should not be ex limited to those around us. Uh, our ethical concerns should be extended to anywhere under the heaven universe. And uh, I would say, I give a very, very similar answer. Um, I am the first person in the West to come up with the notion of a human virtue and a human good life as opposed to male or female virtue or the virtue of an old or young person or a rich or poor person. And I have this human ideal. And uh, after me, um, followers of mine, the Stoics, developed this ideal and developed a notion of a cosmopolis. Um, and cosmopolitanism. So I'm very, very interested in what connects us as a, as a human race. Um, I agree that uh, we need to start with our, look, make, make sure we have taken care of our local communities, but absolutely we should extend that concern to the human race as a whole. And again, I am not hugely concerned with territorial uh, boundaries. And um, can I just say what an honor it is to, to meet Confucius here tonight. <laughs> I've never heard his name, but I did hear ideas from the East were coming into Athens on the trade routes. So I was beginning to hear about Eastern ideas and it's a huge honor to meet Confucius tonight. Same here. Okay. <laughs> well, it, 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 it's time to pull the masks off now. I, I, I just want to say, um, uh, we've been playing a, in a way a game here tonight but the, 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 the knowledge and the wisdom uh, uh, of, of our two guests tonight, I, I feel as men that some of the, the particularly the kind of ethical um, uh, values and the, the integrity of the thought of these two, these, these two 
uh, philosophers who, who, who died two and a half thousand years ago, it's really come across. There have been moments tonight where it's really, it's been in the room. So uh, if I can thank our, uh, my real interlocutors and ask you to join me in, in thanking both Professor, Professor Hobbs, um, uh, Annie Hobbs, <laughs> and Professor Joseph Chan. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.